It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Devijit Bera from IIIT Delhi. Dr. Bera is Assistant Professor at Indraprasth Institute of Information Technology, IIIT Delhi. He obtained B.Tech in Computer Science from IIT Kanpur in 2002 and his PhD in Computer Science from Boston University, USA in 2009. His main research interests are in theoretical computer science with special interest in algorithms and complexity analysis. Other academic interests are in computer systems, security and databases. He is also interested in the application of computer science theory, especially complexity theory, in other research areas like basic sciences, economics and biosciences. He was awarded as the best teaching fellow in computer science department at Boston University in 2007. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bera. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I should have been here earlier, but I just couldn't make it because of the end of semester of grading and stuff. But I was going through the abstracts and they just look fabulous. All various kind of, very different aspects of quantum computing. Uh, it was, uh, it's unfortunate that I couldn't be here earlier. Uh, that also means that some of the things I'll be talking today, there might be a small repetition because some of the things might have been covered earlier. Uh, I just hope that uh, notwithstanding the repetitions, you'll still be able to take back something after the talk. So, uh, unlike uh, uh, the talks that I've seen earlier, uh, this will be a completely different flavor. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, uh, so, I'm basically a computer science theorist, so we do pen and paper stuff. And uh, I'll give you a flavor of what pen and paper things we do in, uh, for quantum computers. So as I tell my colleagues that, uh, well, you know, so I have my friends who actually build quantum communication systems and those things, and I tell them that uh, no matter what thing you come up with at the end, we have, we have algorithms, we have a way to solve problems on that one. So we are working parallelly, uh, irrespective of the actual model, and I'll give you a flavor of uh, how those things are happening uh, in today's talk. So I'll be talking about the uh, computational complexity of the quantum circuit model, and um, it's, it will, since I'm not sure much of many of you have know about the idea of complexity theory, I'll, I'll, uh, to do justice to you, I should introduce the uh, idea of computational complexity. And then I'll go on over this quantum circuit model. It will be a very overview kind of talk. Because, uh, but if something is not making sense, feel free to interrupt, uh, because otherwise you just won't understand it. Oh, this works. Good. So uh, let's just start with a brief uh, idea of a uh, very high level overview of uh, computational complexity theory. So what do we do here? Um, so we look at computational problems. Um, for us, problems, uh, a problem is a function which takes some input and has an output, as simple as that. Uh, the inputs can be integers, real numbers, rationals, sets, graphs, wires, houses, buildings, universe, anything you want. Outputs can be anything you want. There's no constraint on those things. So, on, uh, so below, uh, we have a, have a list of example functions that interests us uh, uh, computing the XR of n binary inputs, multiplying two n bit integers, and all kind of things. Uh, on the right hand, I have solving a system of n linear equations with integer variables. Now, uh, so for those of you who have actually tried these things on hand, uh, I'm not really good with this one at least. Uh, for those of you who have tried these things in hand, Definitely you would feel that solving a linear system of equations is probably looks harder than computing the XR of binary inputs. No matter how you have tried it, you have tried a, a C program or you have tried an actual circuit or whatever it is. If you want to build a circuit for solving a linear equations, it is going to be tough, I think so. Uh, so our goal is to somehow capture this idea that, okay, it looks tough, but is it really tough? And I mean, can we somehow come up with a, a notion of toughness? and how to abstract it out, how to get a property of it, how to build a theory out of it. And that's all it is, complexity theory. So we analyze complexity of functions. Let's just be a little bit more specific because I, I want to explain this whole thing with respect to quantum circuits. Um, so let's just take this pro particular problem, sorting integers. Uh, most of us are familiar with this problem. Now, uh, no matter what uh, actual computation you perform, it can be divided into two main parts. Uh, a type of machine, 
uh, the underlying hardware and uh, the solving procedure on top of it. Now, procedure is definitely tied to this type of machine, but there is some sort of a general idea about sorting that you will find in all different sorting procedures across different machines. So you can sort of basically break it out. So let's just take some examples. So it's not important what actual stuff comes up here. Uh, but so this is a general problem. Now one machine, one model is the training machine which sort of captures uh, stored program uh, computing devices like C, Fortran, Java, those kind of things, uh, real life computers. And so this is an algorithm to do it. Okay. Uh, random access machine somewhat models um, at RAM at, uh, machines with uh, no external storage, just like caches and RAMs and these kind of things. It's a different model. And uh, for those of you who know about sorting, you might know that there is a, a sorting takes n log n for, uh, for on computers, but here it is actually significantly smaller than that. And that is the reason is because the model has changed. This testimony pointed out that one you change, once you change the machine, the efficiency actually changes. You don't really need to understand what the details are there. Here is a Boolean circuit and here is a sorting network. So you can actually uh, have a circuit for sorting. You feed in inputs and the output you get are sorted. There are standard ways of getting this uh, circuit in, uh, in a real life using the real uh, proper gates. And for communication network with distributed system uh, with fa no failures and all kinds of things, uh, you can actually do a sorting on this. There are different algorithms for that. So we have different kind of uh, models for machines and depending on that we have different kind of algorithms. They are somewhat tired but the general idea of sorting here is all the, there is a general basic knowledge of sorting here which is being applied here. So given this, we any computation we break it up into kind of two distinct parts then an algorithm or actual model. And uh, once we have this we can as uh, 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 a capacity theory what it does is it's it tries to look at, it tries to compare computations by analyzing their properties. And how do we uh, do that? By, uh, by defining the notion of hardness or complexity. We say that a problem uh, is very hard or harder than another problem because maybe it's because of the machine. Maybe because the machine is so stupid that if you want to do anything simple, you need a lot of steps, a lot of any resource. Complexity denotes some idea of a resource. We'll go, go to the resource, come to the resources soon. Uh, but may, maybe uh, a problem is such that no matter how smart the machine is, if you do the world's fastest computer, it is still going to take a lot of, lot of time because the problem itself is very complicated. It's like linear programming kind of thing, those kind of things. So we define different, we define different hardness notions and different complexity metric to uh, look at these properties. The usual complexity metrics can be running time. There is a usual notion we all mostly use, how long it takes. Uh, another one frequently used is the number of local variables. Um, those of you know sorting, know the idea of mod sort, quick sort, even though mod sort can actually take sometimes, uh, theoretically take better, uh, takes, runs faster than quick sort, but uh, uh, quick sort is actually known quick sort because it uses fewer local, variab uh, local variables, fewer uh, space to uh, workspace. And so it's actually an important resource. If you are if you're doing a computation on uh, on a huge data set, then you often often you and often the amount of data you have exceeds your main memory. And once you go to the storage, external storage like disk, things start become expensive. So you so the number of mem memory you're actually using it's actually an important resource. So we try to capture that using this one. The amount of randomness is another important resource because uh, uh, there are a lot of algorithms out there which depend which are randomized algorithms, probabilistic algorithms which use randomness. And all this is just flip a coin or get uniformly a number uh, uh, from a 1 to 10. Well, getting a number from 1 to 10 uniformly with this guaranteed uniformly is not easy. I mean, whatever, if you have an algorithm to get a number, then that number is not random. You have an algorithm for it. So it's very hard and, and there are very sophisticated physical devices out there to get a proper random bits. This is actually a very important resource and there are complexity proper measures to compare algorithms based on that. If it's a communication algorithm, something to do with distributed networks, communication, the number of communication bits, that becomes the important prime thing. And so these are the metrics and what we do with the models, we, some, we provide, uh, we try to come up with equivalence notions. We say that this model is equivalent to that model in the sense that uh, I can simulate a circuit by a Turing machine which takes double the time or something like that. A RAM is similar to a, a circuit which takes half the space, something like that. So we know that 
using some model want to model two adds this much to the cost this much to the uh, complexity metric and then the, the and then according to the problem should be this much and then we compare uh, we compare different problems so that's the main two goal comparing uh, comparing computations analyzing properties so when quantum computing came out to compare uh, figure out the, the kind of questions they were asked one kind of question they were asking how uh, how better are these with respect to classical machines because we know a lot of our classical uh, classical computers classical algorithms how good are these so uh, natural uh, uh, way to analyze the improvement of quantum algorithms or quantum strategies uh, with respect to classical ones is to use complexity theory to uh, analyze them and that's what we are going to do today so i'll come to quantum circuit model which is a machine model for quantum algorithms and i will try to see how they compare with respect to the uh, classical models but to uh, tell you one more that i want to first introduce you to the classical boolean circuit model which is a simplified form of the and or gate circuits and uh, the quantum circuit model is uh, is based on this idea of uh, boolean uh, classical boolean circuits um so let's first go to classical uh, boolean circuits so it's the usual thing you know i have a uh, i have a boolean circuit here which i have no idea what it does i just copied it from google uh, it's an acyclic network of boolean uh, boolean gates they are connected by wires you feed in uh, boolean inputs here and uh, you can do all kind of timing uh, you can introduce timing to figure out when does an output bit come but essentially you whenever you feed an input to a gate an output comes out and you move from the input towards the output the output uh, wire contains the value of the output circuit that's the simplified form of a of a boolean circuit this is equivalent to the turing machine uh, for those who haven't heard of a turing machine it's a machine model which sort of captures the programs that we write today roughly in a way and any computation can be uh, any computation can be represented as a turing machine so a circuit essentially captures anything any computable computing uh, any computation and any computation can also be captured by a turing machine essentially and it uh, clearly it seems all of these are boolean gates this as whole circuit computes a boolean function at its inputs okay so far so good uh, let's now come to try to uh, evaluate it uh, the what are the parameters uh, for complexity well first of all um, uh, trying to talk about the parameter of a circuit is of a particular circuit is not very useful because i can look at the circuit and say okay this uses this many number of gates this many number of wires so how do i evaluate the parameters uh, one uh, one way to do that is because uh, when i when i'm looking at a general problem it works for inputs of many lengths uh, so i can have a multiplication procedure which multiplies two integers the two integers can be two bit integers three bit four bit five bit six bit thousand bit something like that but one particular circuit can only multiply uh, uh, in, uh, integers of let's say two bits or ten bits it cannot multiply two uh, integers of any number of bits so to capture this what we do is we say that we will have one circuit for each input length and essentially we get a circuit family and then uh, so this family we say that this family computes the fu uh, function and of this family this particular circuit cn it will compute the function on the nth input so it's the characteristics of the function so we have a, a family of infinite family of circuits a family of infinite circuits to compute a particular function and uh, what are parameters the parameters now become a function of inputs for example i can say that multiplying two two bit integers take o of n square gates so it says that if you are multiplying four bit integers it will take uh, about 16 gates plus minus sum if you are multiplying to 100 bit integers it will take about 10 to the 4 gates so so now parameters now become uh are parameterized parameters have become function of n and now we can take two circuits and look at uh, their parameters as functions and then compare the functions how bad or how good they are and then that's how we can uh, do some comparisons so uh, what are the typical parameters that are used uh then uh, one is the types of gate what gates we use usual universal gates and not uh, and not or not nand this kind of things there are some uh, uh, there was once an effort in the in the in the circuit complexity community to uh, because uh, not sometimes cause a problem in trying to analyze the functions so there was a model of monotone circuits which do not have any not gate and it uh, and uh, it was hoped that this would give us 
So this actually allows us to do some interesting, allows us to do some interesting, it allows us to analyze some uh, nice functions. So there is a small lot of monotone circuits. So you can have very dif basically different type of gate sets and this, this is one way to uh, compare circuits. Uh, number of gate input wires, uh, usually circuits we draw uh, or uh, teach in the, in the introductory hardware or uh, electrical engineering. Introductory the circuit design courses I have like two inputs or three inputs. But when we're doing the circuits, we can try to compare them. Since now we are ha we have a circuit family, so we have one circuit for uh, each input length. We can talk about the general uh, number of inputs to gates. This this term is called uh, fan in the number of inputs to a gate. So it can be a uh, constant. So we look, look at the maximum number of input that the circuit allows a gate and circuit allows. It can be a constant like two, like the circuit that I there was in the example before, or it can be unbounded. I can have any number of inputs coming in. Does it really change? The question is, does it really change? If I move from constant to unbound, how much power does it add? Does it really change uh, my model? Uh, and, this, and this is called uh, fan-in. Uh, the number of gates in the circuit, uh, it's, called the, it's known as the size of the circuit, and this is clearly an uh, important parameter. It can be, I mean, it can be different, it can be linear in n, polynomial in n, it can be like exponentially in n, nobody, I mean, people are not really interested in the exponential, in the exponential case. Mostly linear and polynomial are interesting case. And uh, lastly, there is the idea of a depth of a circuit. Now, what is the depth? The circuit is like a tree, right? A satellite network, so like a tree. So you count the maximum uh, number of gates from the input to the output. Or uh, from the output, you compute the maximum depth uh, to the input. So, it's, uh, so if you have some kind of timing from the for the for the gate computing, then this depth will sort of roughly give you the time it takes to compute because every gate will take one time, and so so this depth of a circuit is going to give the maximum time it takes to compute. So, uh, so the, the, the depth of a circuit, people usually talk about constant or log or uh, powers of log, log square, something like that. You don't really, com so uh, I mean since a circuit can be represented as a tree, uh, with log you are allowing about 2 to the log n number of gates, so n gates. So if you allow, uh, so, so people don't really talk about linear depth circuit, because linear depth means you are allowing two to be an exponential number of gates, and that becomes that doesn't become very interesting. So these are the usual constraints that people talk about: constraint uh, constant log uh, uh, n, where n is the number of inputs, and we are allowing the log number of uh, depth. Okay. So what are the kind of questions? There are some jargons here. There are some, it's not very important what they are, but mostly. Uh, I, have to, I think I should explain a few of them. So, uh, peak alternative is a well-known problem. Many of you, it sometimes comes in the news. The, it, let me just came in the news a couple of months ago. Um, so, so this uh, MP is contains all problems, which are and there are different ways to explain it. One way to go about it, it uh, the best way to solve MP problems is exhaustive search. Kind of roughly you can do this. So, all kind of like satisfiability. These are MP problems. And there aren't, people believe that uh, there is, uh, you cannot solve these problems in polynomial time. Um, interesting enough, if P equals to NP is proved, then cryptography and all of things will break. Uh, so, this is, this is a, I mean, this, this P equals to NP, whether you can have a polynomial time algorithm for NP problems, this sort of started the whole field of complexity theory, and it's still the essential question. But there are other questions, uh, other questions like this, for example, this, this question asks, can we have polynomial size circuit for NP problems? Can we build a polynomial size circuit to solve satisfiability? Let's say. Now that would be something, some, something, something, if you can prove this, that would be something interesting. That means we can have reasonably small circuits. Polynomial size circuits means they are not very large. Uh, I mean, I can play with the idea that the polynomial can be large, but uh, roughly. We, so if we can build up a polynomial size circuit for NP, that would be a very strong result. So that's, that's another interesting open question that's still not yet resolved. Um, on the left, here are problems which take, which are even more complex than uh, NP. It's like grandfather of NP. So if NP takes two to the n, this takes two to the two to the n, roughly. And ACC zero are circuits which are polynomial circuits with just uh, extra. You just add mod uh, XOR gates. Just think the uh, so mod gates. I think of them as XOR gates. I'll come to mod gates later. So this is this is a not very powerful class of circuits. And this is a constant depth circuit. So this is essentially on the right hand side you don't have a very powerful set of circuits. On the left hand side you have very complicated problems. And the question is, can we uh, solve all these complicated problems using these simple circuits? The answer to all of them is believed to be no. 
and we don't know much of them except this was disproved one month ago after a lot of uh, effort. So the answer is no. And uh, 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 scientific computer theory was uh, invented in a way to answer these questions. So the main uh, goal of scientific complex circuit models is to give lower bounds that you cannot do this. Since a circuit is an, a real thing, you can draw an actual circuit, unlike a TV machine, you have to draw a circuit and look at its circuit. This is the circuit for doing this particular thing. It, it's tempting to think that you probably would be analyzed a lot more about it. You probably would be able to say, we cannot solve this problem with this circuit, except that it's not very trivial to do. It's a, come to all kind of challenges, and uh, that's what is uh, still giving us in job. Um, so, uh, so, and so we, uh, so okay, let me just look at some interesting lower bounds that have been proven for with uh, this billion circuits. So uh, click uh, is uh, so click is uh, so if you have a graph, a network, a click is a, a set of nodes in it which are completely connected to each other. So if we have a vast network and let's say we find it has five nodes which are all connected to each other. So all five of them are connected to each other. So such nodes finding such uh, complete subgraphs, these are called clicks. Finding clicks is, has become very important thanks to the proliferation of social networks and network, general proliferation of network in all kinds of things. We have networks of uh, you know, personal information, we have networks of friends, we have networks of you know, uh, academic communities, so there are networks all around the world, large scale networks, and finding clicks is a very important problem has turned out to be. So it was proved that we cannot compute click uh, using less than polynomial number of gates, using these kind of gates. So this, so this kind of results are very interesting. Uh, so also, for example, here is another thing. Parity is uh, XR. Uh, 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 so uh, XR is because two is extended to n bits. So we are uh, com we are uh, computing their uh, uh, their XR of n things. That's called parity. Um, so computing the parity, it was proven that it requires at least exponential side circuits. If you want to use constant depth and unbounded fan in AND gate or with an NOT gate. And so these are the kind of results that has been proven and uh, these allow us to prove more complicated things but these are some of the things that we, have, we can say. These kind of lower bounds are what, what interests us, that this problem cannot be done with this. So let's just, with that in mind, let's just come to quantum circuit model. So that, again the motivation is, uh, for the quantum part is that we want to find out lower bounds for the computational problems, also upper bounds and we want to figure out this problem can be solved by this kind of circuits. But the main motivation, uh, because we want to compare it with classical circuits, the main motivation sort of, actually it goes both ways. Uh, one other motivation is that we want to figure out the lower bounds. We cannot compute this circuit, this problem with these kind of circuits. And we want to compare them with classical circuits. So let me just give you a basic idea of the of quantum circuits. So I'll just use some notations. I was not sure what notations people have used to. So, uh, so H is the usual two-dimensional Hilbert space. Two computational basis states, uh, zero and one. Uh, uh, so B n is the two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. The basis states are all uh, uh, are, we are two to the uh, n basis states, and I represent them as integers of n bit length. So these are all n bit uh, integers. I'll uh, denote uh, i denote the basis two to the n computational basis states as this one, and the state of over n qubit will be just a state in this uh, two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, quantum gate is just an unitary operator which is acting on the states on the, in this uh, two to the n dimensional space. Now what about circuits? Circuits are, uh, since we want to compare them with classical function, classical circuits and classical circuits only compute classical functions, we, we are restricting ourselves to circuits which compute classical functions. So the inputs will be, uh, inputs will still represent uh, classical inputs like binary boolean inputs x i is x i is in 0 1 0 1 value inputs uh, and which so if the input is some x 1 to x n we will we'll represent them as the initial state of the circuit the, in, the initial state the input to the circuit will be this uh, state represented by x 1 to x n right? so this is their computational basis state and the output is again uh, it's a class it's a classical it's a proper a boolean output so it will be again a 0 1 or a 0, 1 valued output and so that will be, we will say that the output of the circuit is you measure the circuit at the, at the output qubit, whatever value you get after measurement uh, of the qubit that I will denote as the output of my circuit. So that's my, uh, that's my quantum circuit. Okay, so I mean here I have some quantum circuit, 
two quantum circuits. And uh, so let's just look at the parameters what we have to we're going to be using. So as before, we have the types of gates. We'll talk more about them in more detail. But as before, we have types of gates, the number of gate input wires, how many. Uh, so this, uh, so this gate has input one. This has input three. But if we are talking about circuit family, then we can talk about uh, whether gates take constant number of inputs or unknown number of inputs. Um, depth of a circuit is again the, uh, the, the, the number of uh, gates from the output to the input, which for a quantum circuit would be just the number of layers, if you can see them as, see them as layers. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that will be 7 for this one. Another interesting thing that uh, comes for a quantum circuit is the number of ancillas. What are ancillas? Now, uh, when computing, you often uh, need extra workspace qubits, extra temporary space, class space, temporary space to store a value temporarily and then use it, use it later. Now, so this was not a very important thing for, for classical circuits because we can just have uh, one uh, one extra uh, extra bit initialized to zero, and anytime we need to store value, we can just store a value there. Or we want to use a value zero, we can just use it, if you want to use the value 1, we'll just pass it through a NOT gate and use it. And if you need multiple uh, multiple storage, multiple extra bits, we can just uh, you know, split the wire, take a wire splitter, split the wire, a solder or wire and get multiple values out of it. So it was this extra number of, uh, this uh, constant extra bits, these uh, extra bits were not a very important thing for classical circuits. But it is very important for quantum circuits because we just cannot arbitrarily create uh, qubits out of the, out of the blue. And we cannot overwrite, we cannot erase. So if we need 18 extra qubits at some point in the computation, we have to have extra 18 extra qubits at the beginning also. So because of the no-coding theorem, we just cannot copy also. So it actually becomes very uh, interesting that this is becomes a very important property, the number of extra workspace qubits. So, uh, so for example, this circuit, whatever it computes, it's, so, so this is an extra workspace qubit, whose initial value is set to 0. And now these are the inputs. And, and then you compute the circuit, and so this, uh, this the number of ancillas are 1. So we call them ancillary qubits or ancillas. And so this is also another uh, important parameter for quantum circuits. Um, so just a couple of terms that come in, in, the, in, the, in the literature. Uh, there is the notion of a clean circuit in which the ancilla is returned to the initial state. It will be returned to the value, I mean, whatever, whichever circuit returns the ancillas back to the state 0, that's called a clean circuit. And why is it important? Because such circuits allow us to uh, compose, compose them. If, if a circuit uh, brings back the ancilla to 0, that means I can take two circuits and then compose them, because the ancilla is back to 0. And so such circuits are, uh, are useful in that way. Uh, reversed circuits are uh, circuits which accept ancilla in any initial state. It does not require you to be 0. Uh, so, you know, whatever initial state it works, it will, it will work for, it will work for that ancillary. It, it's able to, work, it's a smarter way of doing it, but it can do it. And there, uh, this also makes, that means that it doesn't, it can work with any kind of ancillary, because you, sometimes you are not sure after computation what, what the value of the ancillary is. And if you want to, comp, if you want to apply another circuit on it, uh, if it's not robust, that means you have to first somehow make that uh, ancillary bit back to zero and then reuse it. That can take extra effort. If it's a robust circuit, you can just directly go and apply the circuit, it's still going to work. So, uh, with these five properties, let's just uh, look at uh, what quantum gates are. It has to be a fixed family of gates. Now, what do I mean by fixed family? Remember, quantum gates are unitary, basically unitary operators. So, uh, theoretically, it's possible to have an infinite family of them. I can have a you know gate for which computes uh, which rotates some vector by 0 0.01. Now I can have one for 0 0.02, and I can have a, a, a continuous like a function, continuous collection of uh, gates. Now that we believe is hard to implement. How can you have? It's hard to implement an infinite family of uh, gates. So we require a fixed family. Uh, Apparently, we don't say. I mean, depending on the actual definition, the number of gates, the actual gates you use can change. But whatever it is, it, you have to sort of tell me, I'm going to use these, these, these particular gates. You're not allowed to come up with a new gate in the middle. That's the we thing is cheating. Okay. Uh, single qubit gates are gates which work on, on single qubits. It's like fan in one. Uh, so one qubit gates. The usual gates, so you know, we can work with any reasonable set. Uh, so usual gates are like Hadamard gates, 
Torus gate, fiber gate, Z gate, uh, these kind of gates. Uh, and these are the gates that provide the quantum behavior. Uh, you will understand this once I come to the other one. Uh, so, as in a single qubit, there are these multi qubit gates which allow unbounded fan in. So, many, it can have many inputs. And uh, some, what are some of the gates of this kind? So, there is this gate called generalized Toffoli gate. Um, we will we'll go through, I will try to go, go through some of these gates in detail. So, there is a gate called generalized Z gate which sort of takes the Z gate and generalizes to multiple, multiple qubits. This parity gate, threshold gate. So these are mostly classical gates because they somehow compute the classical function. We, uh, since, uh, I mean, it might be infeasible to, I mean, since these gates are unbounded fan in, uh, it might be infeasible to compute large quantum gates. I mean, unbounded fan in means if I have a circuit that works on 100 uh, qubits, then Theoretically, we are allowing a gate which uh, can take 100 bits, 100, uh, 100 bit gate. That kind of might be hard to implement, I and mean, it might be very, very complicated. So we only we only allow these gates to be just just do classical kind of uh, functions. We'll see how these are done, but we don't allow them to be very complicated. So that's why I said so. These gates are where the actual quantumness comes in. They do the actual vector, uh, take a vector, rotate it, and all kind of change the phase of the state to do these kind of things, these are mostly to sort of assimilate the information. So that allows us to sort of subtly say that these, so these will correspond to classical uh, gates in the cla for classical circuits, uh, whereas these will provide the quantum and so then we can compare if you have a quantum circuit and a classical circuit, where is the change coming from. And as just like uh, Boolean circuits, we have a universal family, in Tuffalo, uh, Hadamard and Pi it is a universal family, and there are various other universal family of gates. Okay, right, so let us go through this of the gates. Uh, so, uh, the, so the gates are classical in a sense that if you have a function which takes n bit input and one bit output, then we compute a gate in this manner. It takes, it works on n plus one qubits and keeps the first n as same and just uh, exhorts, applies a function on the first n uh, on this n values and then exhorts it with b. Uh, things, you have probably have seen this kind of things for when you have talked about browsers or shows kind of thing. This kind of things come up. So let us take an example. Uh, okay, uh, so, and, and this is our behavior for the for the for the basic states. You can extend them linearly for any other superposition of states. So Toffoli uh, gate computes the function of and. That is, the f is f becomes the and function. Uh, the usual Toffoli gate was invented for three qubits. So this is just a generalization of it to n qubits. Okay. So f is the AND function, so what it does is, uh, uh, it, uh, for the computational basis state, it leaves these bits, uh, these qubits unchanged, and this one it exhausts the uh, bit B with uh, the, part of the, uh, the, the AND of all of these, all of these bits. Okay, uh, these, are, these are some new gates, the MOD2 gate. Uh, MOD2 gate, the function is now the parity, the, uh, the, the XOR of all, the, all of these bits. So essentially the output, everything remains same, here we get the uh, parity, the mod 2, the XR of all the, all the inputs. Again, these are all for the computational basis state. You can extend them to the other superposition. Mod 2 gate uh, is extension of mod 2 gate, where instead of 2, we have Q. So what it outputs, we still want a 0, 1 output. So what it does is it computes the sum of the, of the input bits. If the sum is 0 mod q, that is sum is divisible by q, then it outputs 0. If the sum is 1 mod q, then it outputs 1. So it basically figures out whether the sum is a multiple of q or not for a fixed q. So we can have mod 3 get the inputs are a multiple of the inputs are a multiple of 3. So if, if 3 bits are set to 1, if only 3, if exactly 3 bits are set to 1, it will output z, uh, 1. If 6 bits are set to 1, it will output 1. 9 are set to 1, it will output 1. And everything else will set, it will output 0. So that's the mod 3 gate, and you can extend it to any mod gate. This is another gate which becomes very important when we are talking about uh, Boolean circuits, the threshold gate. What it does is it takes a fixed parameter k, so we say threshold 3, threshold 5. So threshold 5, what it will do is it will add the inputs. It's basically kind of figuring out whether the number of 1s are more than a threshold or not. So if the number of 1s are more than k, uh, greater than or equal to 5, then it will output 1. If the number of ones are less than five, they will output zero. So this simple way to just count the count the number of inputs whether it will be above a separate certain level or not, and that's called a threshold gate. 
And again, uh, we just do it the same way with the, the, this is the function and we, are, uh, we XR it with the target uh, bit and we get the, we get the function. Uh, this, so last two gets are slightly different. Uh, this is a generalized Z get. A, a Z get only uh, changes the, um, so if you apply a Z get on, on, on the state 0, it remains 0. If you apply it on the state 1, it becomes uh, minus 1. The phrase is multiplied by negative 1. This is just an extension of that to, uh, to multiple multiple qubits. So if the if all the xi's are one, then the state is multiplied by the phase minus one, and if any of them is zero, it gets it stays the same. Uh, this get is very useful when you are when we are designing some some of the circuits, uh, uh, but it is it is not a very completely new uh, notion. Because uh, this is a, a Z gate can be applied, uh, can be obtained by just conjugating an Hadamard gate on the target side of a Toffoli gate. So you take a Toffoli gate, you, had, uh, you conjugate it with Hadamard side on both the sides and you get a Z gate. So it's not a very, it's not a rocket science thing, but it just makes, us, makes it easy. And the reason it makes it easy is because it leaves the actual state unchanged. It only works on the amplitude. So these kind of gates can be used for robust computing because it, the state is unchanged. Uh, the only the phase is changed, so you can actually play with this quite a bit. It actually makes your life easier. And last comes uh, the interesting part, the fan out get. Well, we know that fan out is impossible uh, in quantum uh, circuit, and the reason is we cannot clone. So, uh, in classical circuits, okay, so what is fan out? Fan out basically means you are, you are uh, duplicating values, you are making multiple copies of one value. So, in a classical circuit, if you split a wire, if you solder multiple wires, we get multiple copies of the same value. And that this operation is called fan out, and that kind of thing naively is it cannot do that for quantum circuits because that would mean we are making three copies of a state, and we cannot just do that out of one copy because that will violate the no cloning theorem. So, uh, but this idea of making multiple copies, it's very much useful when we're designing a when we're designing a, any kind of algorithm. We need to make a copy of a variable to use it for later. This idea is. No matter what model you use, this idea comes back in some form or the other. This is not a problem for classical circuits. So uh, what we do is we uh, so people have invented a thing called a fan out gate. The the operation of the fan out gate uh, for for basic states is given uh, here. Uh, what it does is uh, if you uh, so what it, I mean, how does it fan out? If you pass all zeros all of these and the and the b where b can be set to a zero or one, you end up getting the copy of b in all of them. Now you might think, well, I am actually getting multiple copies of b, but remember this b can only be zero or one. It cannot be a superposition. So I am not really keep creating multiple five copies of b. I am only copying the basic state zero into five cop, uh, into five places, five qubits and one into five qubits. I'm not able to do anything if I pass a superposition, I'm not going to get uh, five copies of the superposition of the qubit here. So that's so it only copies the basic step, but that is still something that will allow us to uh, use the idea of creating multiple copies. So this is a this is a gate called finite gate and this is an interesting properties as we'll see soon. Okay. So let's just uh, let, me, so let me just highlight you on some of the interesting results comparing uh, classical and quantum, and uh, give you a, sort of some interesting uh, uh, subtleties about this quantum gates. Uh, let's look at the mod two function. Now this is the mod two gate, and you, you know if you follow this whole thing, you, you can sort of see that the mod two gate uh, can be obtained by the, this is a fan out gate in the middle. Uh, and if you just conjugate a Hadamard gate on both the sides, you essentially get a mod 2 gate. Now, uh, what that means is uh, we can compute the mod 2 operation using uh, single qubit gates. Uh, oh, actually, we don't even need Toffoli gate. Using single qubit gates and fan out gate, we can obtain a mod 2 gate in constant depth. And linear size, it has only uh, you know, uh, 2n plus 1 number of gates. This is this 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 gate is using. So we can compute the mod 2 operation using linear size circuit and constant depth. Uh, whereas classically, it has been proven that if you only allow so corresponding to single qubit gates, we will have single uh, bit gates for classical, which is just the only one we know is not gate. Uh, so if you allow not gates uh, for 
so we allow in unbounded gates here so we allow we can allow unbounded and and gates so if we allow the same kind of resources here not gates and unbounded and gates then we need at least exponential number of gates if you want to do the do if you want to compute mod 2 in constant depth so whereas in classical we need exponential number of gates for the similar problem in quantum we can get it in in uh, in, in only linear number of gates so this is a uh, this is um, interesting it shows that uh, it it shows a uh, one power of this of this quantum circuits uh, in an interesting way and as and, and if you do the whole math if you do the whole logic behind it the whole magic happens in the hadamard gates in these gates the magic happens this is the fan out gate is just some of collecting the information okay let's look at another interesting improvement uh let's look at a mod 2 gate now let's come down here so classically it was shown that if you allow uh, so we want to still again do everything in constant depth and uh, we allow uh, not gates unbounded and gates and unbounded mod p gates now p is a prime and if uh, we want to we want to compute the function mod q where mod q is again the sum uh, mod q so the whether there are at least whether exactly k uh, q mod q will output one if, if the sum is a multiple of q so if you want to compute mod q uh, the function mod q using exponentially uh, using mod p gates uh, and uh, unbounded and gates and not gates in constant depth and if p and q are prime uh, are prime then you need then you need exponentially many uh, many such gates you cannot do them in any reasonable number of size whereas it was uh, it was shown that in quantum you can do much better the rough idea is that if you have some uh, operators uh, some unitary functions some unitary operators which are simultaneously diagonalizable that is you have a single v and a, sing, uh, a single v such that you can write each ui as v di v dagger then uh, and then if you want to apply uh, all of uh, all this uis in series on a particular qubit then you can see that this v and v dagger will cancel out each other and then you left up with something like this if it is simultaneously diagonalizable and then what can you do is you can actually use a find out operator to parallelize all these dis in a single layer this is a interesting trick which you can uh, which allow so if the simultaneously diagonalizable and if you are allowing and out gate then you can diagonal parallelize all of them in a single layer so this was a linear depth circuit and you end up getting a constant depth circuit so this allows us to create a mod q function in constant depth using polynomial and polynomially many single qubit toffly and mod p gates which is again an exponential improvement over uh, over the classical case so we got we saw two exponential improvements for quantum circuits over classical circuits let's see another interesting thing uh Let's consider circuits with a uh, bounded fanning gates, some constant fanning, two, three, whatever, fix, fix your k, fix your in number of inputs. We will only consider constant depth circuits and polynomial size. Now, if it's a constant depth circuits, then you essentially get, get a tree out of, you get a tree here, some constant out degree tree out of here. And if the depth is d, the number of uh, inputs that this uh, root can reach is some, it's some, uh, it's some constant to the power of the depth. So, if it's a constant depth. Then you end up getting a constant here, and we basically, basically means is that this output cannot depend on all the n inputs. It will only depend on only a constant number many inputs. Now that basically means that such circuits are pretty useless. They are, they are not able to they are not even able to read all the input bits. So they so they cannot compute any reasonable function. So uh, even if we, if we, even if we allow unbounded fan out in these gates. We, this the output bit can only depend on a constant number of inputs, and it's pretty much useless function. Nobody actually talks about constant depth circuits with bounded fanning gates. Whereas, uh, if you have a little bit of cheating, since I'm allowing constant unbounded fanning fan out here, we can also use unbounded fan out here. And let's take the same analogy. We will work with uh, unbounded fan out gate, but every other gate will be, will be constant fanning, constant fan out. So all two qubit or one qubit gates. So if you do that, then what you can do is you can again uh, use the same idea of diagonalizability to to sort of parallelize your operations, and you can show that you can do various non-trivial stuff with even in constant depth. For example, you can compute threshold, you can compute parity, you can compute quantum Fourier transform, addition, multiplication, division, sorting, all of this. Uh, you can approximate them. You cannot compute exactly. You can approximate them, but you can still get pretty close 
uh, compared to the uh, compared to the classical classical case. So there is, uh, there is also a very very interesting thing. Especially one reason is because QFT is used in all kinds of places in Go version shows and uh, many of the algorithms they use QFT quantum field transform. And if you can approximate them in a constant depth, that means your circuits are becoming very significantly smaller. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, our, our, uh, so one one question that people ask is, are uh, quantum circuits very uh, always very this powerful? I mean, can they do always better? I mean, always much much better than classical. So uh, there are also negative results. For example, we know that in classical, we cannot compute mod two function, the usual XR, in constant depth. Specifically, we know that. Uh, to compute mod 2, we need exponentially many and or not gates if you want to deal with only constant depth circuits. This was a significant, uh, very, uh, uh, a very uh, famous result a uh, couple of decades ago. And we right now know a, a version of this also for quantum. That is, uh, if you want to co compute mod 2 using constant depth, we are only allowing a family of single qubit and partially gates, then we cannot compute mod 2. We, this is a small limitation here, we can only allow linearly many ancillas. We don't know what happens if we allow polynomial many ancillas or many more. This is a, this is still, so we, we don't have the full glory what we have here, we have some, some, to some extent. So, uh, let me wrap up in the next 5-10 minutes. Um, so, what are the, what are the, what do, what do, what do I want to, what do I want you to get from this one? Uh, this fan of gate seems way too powerful I and mean, it can do all kind of crazy things. Yet, we need this idea of making multiple copies. Uh, it's somehow in there. If you want to write any kind of implementation, we need to store values, we need to reuse values. Um, so, it's necessary. So, maybe there is a better replacement out there? We don't know. Uh, is it, I mean, uh, can we really, uh, I mean, we, just, we saw the negative result. The negative result allowed us to uh, Shows that we cannot compute fan out using a linearly many ancillaries. Maybe if, even if we allow unlimited ancillaries, maybe you still cannot compute fan out. So fan out inherently there is something hard about the function that you cannot compute it using classical or boolean or uh, no matter what a quantum or whatever circuit model you use. Maybe it is that powerful. So this is uh, one interesting idea that people are working on. Uh, uh, can we compute exactly threshold and threshold using fan out, fan out using threshold? Because this threshold function allows us to compute all the arithmetic functions, like addition, multiplication, division, all the basic arithmetic functions can be com computed using threshold in very uh, constant depth and very small size. So it's a very interesting function, very important function uh, for the circuit, circuit complexity uh, point of view. So can we, uh, I mean, can we compute threshold using fan out? Uh, by the way, so there was, uh, I saw a paper by, uh, uh, the Steve Fanner who gave a Hamiltonian to compute the fan out. So he thinks that you can actually implement the fan out gate in, in real practice. So in that case, it will be uh, an interesting thing to see. Uh, there was this thing I pushed under the rug, this approximation. So the approximately computing, uh, remember, uh, we, so uh, using fan out in constant depth, we were able to compute all these arithmetic functions in constant depth. Well, this approximation is actually not, uh, it's only polynomial, polyn it, only, it allows polynomial error, it does not, uh, it's, the error is not exponentially small. And so, uh, so we would like to get it exponentially small because then it means the get has very few errors. For polynomially, uh, polynomially many errors, we still have, we are still allowing a lot many errors uh, for the get. So that's one area of interest. Um, it can be shown that fan out is equivalent to constructing a cat state in constant depth. So, uh, so it's so you can use a fan out to construct a cat state in constant depth. And if you can do the cat state in constant, you can also compute a fan out. So, and this cat state has an interesting, very interesting way of uh, very interesting notion of entanglement. So maybe uh, this this can allow us to uh, this cat. This equivalence motion can allow us to get us interesting results about lower bounds using entanglement. If we put on somehow bound entanglement, then we can we might be able to prove more circuit lower bounds because that's a thing we don't really understand too much uh, uh, for circuits. At, uh, at, I mean, at least for circuits, and it makes life very difficult. Um, then, uh, as we have this, as we have sort of told that uh, answers are very important resources, and there has been no work 
on the power of ancillaries. What happens if we move from constant to linear, linear to polynomial, polynomial to unbounded? Do we get significantly more functions? Do we get uh, the same functions? What's the story? I mean, definitely when quantum computers come about, the, quantum, the qubits will be uh, expensive. They won't be very cheap. And so it is a very important thing to know how many extra bits you need. Uh, and lastly, uh, quantum circuits, quantum, they, they are inherently probabilistic. You, are, you, when you measure them, you get a probability function out of it. You get a, you get a result in a, a probabilistic way. So they inherently compute probabilistic. And there are well-defined notions of uh, probabilistic uh, uh, circuits, even for Boolean circuit circuits. So uh, one area to look at is uh, to extend the quantum circuits to compute probabilistic functions and try to look at their properties and compare them. Uh, with that, I'll wrap up. And if there are questions, I'll take them.